Hey guys, welcome back to Keys of the Cosmos. This is video number 11 in my series, Astrotography Target Tips. For this video, I want to revisit a section of the sky that I've made a video about before, and that is in Cygnus, and that is in particular the Cygnus Loop. Now, we talked about it in my video on the Eastern Veil Nebula. That's sort of that cosmic flame looking target, and it was a star that went supernova and exploded and sort of left these beautiful filaments of gas and dust in the in our night sky. But the Cygnus loop itself has a couple other primary targets that a lot of astrophotographers will try to image. Now, I'm going to use my original image of the Cygnus loop. This was taken early on. It's pretty terrible, but I'm just going to sort of use it as a reference of where we're talking about. So my last image was the Eastern Veil. You can see that sort of marked on the picture, but Above it, um, at least as it appears in the sky, is the Western Veil. And underneath that, sort of in the middle, it doesn't show up much in this picture because there's very little integration time, I think around an hour and a half, but that's called Pickering's Triangle. And so I found myself sort of outside, I can't remember what happened, but for some reason I had to sort of make a, my original target wasn't, wasn't gonna work out and I sort of had to make a last minute decision on what to shoot. So I'd never like to be in that position, but. There I was, and I thought on a whim, I'm going to try and shoot the Western Veil Nebula. I had never shot it on its own before, and I thought I would give it a go. So I, I pointed my telescope in that direction, and I framed it up, and I took my test shot, and I noticed the um, Pickering's Triangle came up in that 30-second exposure, which was quite surprising. So I thought, you know what, beautiful. Not only will I get the Western Veil, but I'll get some of that uh, Pickering Triangle as well. So that's how this came about and uh, I ended up spending two nights on this particular target. So we'll talk a little bit about that and and this was another one of those instances where I actually went to darker skies, I wouldn't call them dark skies, but darker than here in Toronto. And uh, I'll, I'll reference that in a little bit too. So let's just talk about quickly, we've talked about in other videos, about how to locate the Cygnus loop. Well, it's in the constellation Cygnus. Talked about that one many, many times. It's the summer swan, one of the most recognizable constellations in our night sky. It sort of looks like the summer cross and very easy to find underneath the brightest star Vega. You'll see that sort of cross in the sky. That's the, the main body of the swan. And we're focusing on that lower wing. Okay, so in that lower wing, that very first star, uh, just underneath it and to the right is where the Cygnus loop is, particularly this portion that we're talking about, which is the, as I mentioned, the Western Veil and Pickering's Triangle. That's sort of the upper portion of um, Cygnus loop. So should be fairly easy to find. If you're in slightly darker skies, the nice thing about the Western Veil is that there's actually a, a fairly large and bright star right in it. Um, you can't miss it. Um, you won't see it in my final image because I actually ended up doing a starless image, but in any other picture that you Google or look up for the Western Veil Nebula, you'll see there's a bright star. And if you're in dark enough skies, you know, probably even border eight, you should be able to see that star, which makes, um, you know, framing up, which we'll talk about in a second, even easier. But Locating it again, Cygnus, look to the bottom wing, that very first star, slightly down to the right, that's where the Cygnus loop is. The nice thing is it's so big that you're uh, more than likely to find a piece of it. And then you can sort of reference a, an app like Stellarium and sort of make your adjustments from there based on what you see on your test exposure. But 20 to 30 second test exposure should be more than enough to get an image and at least give you you know your bearings and, find, and figure out where you are. So let's move into framing, as I mentioned, um, you can use that star in the Western Veil to sort of um, frame it up. Now, in my particular case, my camera, and just happened to be in the position it was when it was screwed onto the telescope, was in an upside down position. So for me, the Western Veil was actually on the bottom, and the Eastern Veil, which I imaged before, would have been on the top. But as it appears in the sky, it's actually reversed. Western Veil is on the top, Pickering's Triangle is underneath, and Eastern Veil is on the bottom. It's not perfectly, it's sort of tilted, but you get the idea. So in my case, um, I had the Western Veil on the bottom and then Pickering's Triangle just above it. And I was able to use that star to sort of uh, take a screenshot of that, you know, that first night, which I always like to do, take a screenshot. In this case, of course, I'm using my ASI Air. So I have my tablet, I take a screenshot. And then the next time I go out, I can reference that picture to sort of line it up the same way. Now just keep in mind with this particular target, um, it's if you're going for the exact same um, portion of the Cygnus loop that I imaged, it's a wide 
um, target, but not a very tall one. So you'll have lots of room up and down, but left to right, it might be a little bit tight. So make sure um, if you need to do a full minute exposure, just to see where exactly in particular Pickering's triangle is. That's the widest part of, of uh, that's sort of right in the middle of the Cygnus loop. So if you picture it as a circle, obviously the widest part, the middle part is going to be the widest. So make sure that you have enough room to be able to make minor crops if you need to. But otherwise, it's pretty easy to frame up. But taking that test shot and that screenshot um, for the next time will really help you in doing that. In this case, I use my Sharp Star 76 millimeter. Now that's not gonna uh, image the entire Cygnus loop. If you wanna do that and then crop into each of those targets, you wanna use something really wide field. So we're talking the Red Cat 51 or a 135 millimeter camera lens. Um, but, so that's what's kinda nice about the Cygnus loop. You can kinda do either or. You can image the whole thing and then sort of crop each target or you can take a little bit more focal length, 76 millimeter, 80 millimeter, maybe even 100 millimeter and just go after certain portions of it. So with my Sharp Star 76 millimeter, again, I had lots of room up and down, but left and right was a little bit tight, but it's definitely a great telescope. That sort of focal length, 340 millimeters, is just right to image you know, a portion of the sky, or an, even more specifically, of Cygnus Loop. So let's talk about integration time. Now, as I mentioned, I did two nights for a total of five hours. Now, for the Western Veil, it's quite bright, even my original picture that I showed, you can see it. This is like an hour and a half. But you notice, as I mentioned, that Pickering's triangle is quite dim. So you're going to want to sink a little bit more time if, if you are hoping to capture that as well. Because it is more, it's definitely not as bright. And there's sort of a lot of fine filaments of gas. So if you sink some integration time into that, that will really help to pull that out. So I'd recommend at least three hours if you're able to. But if you're able to do four, five, even more, you'll definitely get um, your time's worth from it. So I would say at least three to four hours, but even more if you want to really pull out a lot of that, those filaments. But integration time, yeah, you don't need to go crazy on it. This is definitely not the kind of target you need to do, you know, 15, 20 hours. If you're able to, go for it. But I think you'll be quite happy with what you can get between three to five hours. So here is, a, I want to show something quickly before we get into processing. So here's a single exposure. Now, as I mentioned, I did two nights of imaging, but uh, one of the nights was done at a, I'm not going to call it a dark sky site, but it was a darker sky site. So we were going away for the weekend, just north of uh, Toronto, about an hour. And I thought, you know what, let's bring my telescope. It was just sort of a relaxing weekend. So I threw everything in the car and that very first night we had a clear night. So I brought it out and, um, you know, the skies looked good. They weren't incredible. They weren't like when I shot Andromeda in my last video there. Those were some amazing skies, Bortles 5, 6. This was more like 6, 7. I'm going to say more like 7. But it was definitely darker. Um, there were portions of the sky that weren't great, but it was definitely darker overall. And you could definitely see more stars as well. It wasn't like thousands, but uh, much better conditions than here in Toronto. So... I'm glad I was able to take advantage of it. But if you take a look at this picture here, now this is pretty self-explanatory. Here's on the top is the Bordeaux 6, 7, and on the bottom is the Bordeaux 9. It might be hard to tell, but let me see if I can zoom that in a bit. Maybe you can tell now. You see the difference in quality, sky quality, the grain, how much smoother that Bordeaux 7 is? I was actually quite shocked at what a difference. Um, I was glad I was able to take a screenshot of both to compare. And just goes to show, even just going a little bit north and a couple notches down on the Bortle scale, what a difference it makes. I wish I was able to do two nights in that Bortle 7, but unfortunately I wasn't able to. But that just goes to show how much cleaner and it makes processing so much easier when you're able to get the darker skies. That's why I always say, if you're not able to upgrade your equipment, that's okay. At least maybe you can get out the darker skies and you'll get a better result just from doing that. And this goes to show that. So... Here's, let's, let's, before we go into processing, here's my stacked image. Um, as you can see, very dark. Uh, you can't see anything at all. So that moves us nicely into processing. So let's talk about that. In order for to, you know, really pull out, a part in particular, Pickering's triangle and those small filaments, you need to really do a lot of stretching in this, at least with my case in this particular image. I had to do at least five or six stretches before I was really even able to make out Pickering's triangle. Now, I want to mention one thing. I've talked about this many times before, but I noticed in particular with this target, it's so important that you fix sort of the tone, the color tone of your image early on. 
after you start doing four, five, six stretches, you'll notice that your image is gonna to start to go sort of a, a greeny yellow color. So it's important that in, in addition to doing your stretches, you're also doing um, your adjustments uh, when it comes to um, your tone. So it's important and you're, that's done in your levels adjustment. So once you've stretched it three, four times, you wanna make sure you do a couple levels adjustments in between. And what that will sort of help to do is darken the image, but also, I've talked about this before, there's a tab, there's a sampler, there's three samplers on the right side of your levels adjustment box. That middle one is the one you wanna to use. To click on that, and then start clicking on the image in various parts of the background. And you'll notice it'll go from that greeny yellow color as a result of all that stretching, back to a more um, sort of black, dark space color, what you want it to be. And also you'll see, hopefully, that the uh, nebula itself will We'll go back to sort of what you consider a normal color, HA, red, green, a little bit of blue even. So that's so important. If you don't do that early on enough, you're not really gonna be able to fix it. So make sure that after you've done your initial stretching, go to that levels adjustment and fix the tone of your image. I can't stress that enough, it's so important. So lots of stretching for this one. After I was able to bring out as much as I thought I could without it blowing out, it was just mainly about getting the background color the way I liked it. There, I didn't use the lasso tool for once in this image. That was kind of nice. I, I mean, you can if you want, if you really want to go to town and, and start lassoing off different sections of the picture. Nothing wrong with that. As I always mention, though, make sure you feather it out um, using that feather box, at least 30 to 40 pixels, and just be really careful that it looks natural. But for me, I just sort of left it as a whole picture and just sort of in camera raw filter, um, playing with that background to get the contrast right and um, using luminance, okay? So that basically smooths out the background, but at the same time, you're sacrificing detail, so it's a balance. You bring the luminance up and then play with the texture, clarity tabs, and camera raw filter. Um, you're gonna go, wanna go back and forth. Uh, another, another thing that was key to this one was using gradient exterminator. I've talked about that. That's a, an add-on to Photoshop that you have to purchase, but that helps to get that background nice and even. And also, I think I even use Astro Flat Pro, which is, or Plus, which is, a, I made a video on that before. It's a great tool. I don't use it on every image, but because it does do, it does have some, you know, there's a sacrifice. Basically, it makes it very uh, gray looking, and you have to work, do more processing to bring the um, nebula itself back. But it does give you a nice flat background. Um, so I believed I used that as well. I really played with this one with the background color. After I was happy with that, I sort of brought, tried to bring the nebula out, as I mentioned, camera raw filter, playing with the clarity tab, texture. Another thing with this one, with processing, you sort of have a decision to make. Same as I mentioned with the Eastern Veil Nebula. You can go, depending on how you play with the warmth of the picture and the, and the tone of it, you can even do more of a blue and orange um, color, you know, with the, with the nebula itself, or you can go with what is, I'd say, more common, and that's a red and sort of a bluey green. I went with the red and bluey green. That's to my preference, that's what I prefer. But a lot of people you'll see in images will go with that blue and orange. And that's a personal choice and it depends what you like. But that's what's nice about astrophotography, right? We, it's that art side of the, of the hobby where we can sort of do what we want with our pictures. But other than that, um, there wasn't too much overall. Uh, I did find that because of the stretching I did, I was able to get a lot of that, those filaments of gas to appear and as I mentioned, my focus was more on the background and getting that to look even. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I did do a starless version, just like the Eastern Veil. I don't know what it is about the Cygnus Loop. There's just so much detail in it that I find when you remove the stars, you just see so much more. And, and for this one, I sort of had in my mind, like a, I wanted to make it look like a painting. Once I saw that first exposure with Pickering's triangle showing so nicely, that's sort of what came to my mind. And I thought, you know, let's try to make this look sort of like a painting. So I removed the stars in Starnet++. I have a video on that as well. Check that one out if you haven't. It's a really easy program to use. Um, it's free of charge, why not try it on some of your images? This, I think this is a great target to try it on. So I removed the stars using Starnet++ and then you gotta kinda work on the background again. I, some of the stars won't completely rem be removed. You'll find it may look a little bit sort of grainy in the background. So that's again where I went back with luminance tried to smooth that out, tried to make it as even as possible, and then bring back the nebula itself. So that's something you're gonna have to play with, but spend your time. I, I kind of revisited a couple weeks later. I shot this a while back. 
and I played with the background, I got it even a little bit better, a little bit more contrast, right? That's what I wanted to have. Sort of a background that just is there, fades away, and then the, that nebula pops on the, on the front. So I think I was quite happy with the way it turned out. And, um, you know, it's just something different. And uh, I don't do starless images that often, but uh, I thought it, in this case, I was really happy I did it. I thought it made it a unique looking picture. And it really showed all those beautiful filaments of gas. It's such a beautiful area of the sky. And it, the nice thing is so big. And as I mentioned, you have options. You can shoot the whole thing or you can just shoot one of those three key areas, you know, or multiple ones like I did in this particular um, picture. But yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. Um, if you haven't given it a go, I really suggest that you try the Cygnus loop. Uh, if you can't get the whole thing in your with your telescope, just focus on sort of one of one of the three or two of the three main areas, the Eastern Veil, Western Veil, and Pickering's Triangle. Or if you have a wide field one, shoot the whole thing. Spend some time on it, and that way you'll be able to have some freedom to sort of crop and maybe just choose portions of it and make a picture just of that. Uh, you don't always have to include the whole target per se. You can just sort of take bits of each one and, and make your own sort of framing. You know, be creative with it and, and make something original, maybe some uh, a, a particular framing that no one else has come up with with before so spend some time with it enjoy it and uh you know hopefully i see your images on instagram and i'm really happy with this so i'm glad that i did it but moving on we're looking forward to lots more to come and i'm, I'm really hoping for some clear nights to, in the near future so i can get more time on that mount and and you know get some videos on how to use it and using what my big refractor that i haven't really been able to use and of course my edge hd as well so all those things to look forward to. Thank you so much, guys, for your support. I really appreciate it. I'm up over 300 subscribers. I know that's not a lot to many guys, but I really appreciate it. And I appreciate your wonderful comments, uh, messages you guys send me on Instagram. Again, at Keys to the Cosmos. If you haven't, visit me there. And uh, even some emails from the website, uh, keys to the cosmos.com. I really appreciate your support. And I want to continue making videos. And hopefully, you guys benefit from it and we can all learn from each other. Thanks again, guys. I really appreciate it. And I will see you on the next one. Take care.